What's going on? Welcome to the New Music Business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book, third edition, coming out later this year. Look out for that. Today's episode is a deep one, a big one. It's a long one, as you can see for the timestamp. Um, we're talking all things finance today. My guests are Chloe Churko. She is a business manager, uh, primarily working with musicians and recording studios. And we have Stephanie Belcher, who is is a tax preparer. So we get deep into the weeds of all things financial in this episode, bookkeeping, tax preparing, uh, 1099s, LLCs, S-Corps, all of that stuff. Now, Chloe Churko, she had, was a studio operations manager at the Hideout Recording Studio for nine years in Las Vegas. Uh, she officially manages rock producer Kevin Churko, and she's worked with Five Finger Death Punch, Disturbed, Papa Roach, In This Moment, Skillet, Backstreet Boys, Lil Wayne, and many more. She has been recognized for her work and awarded several RIAA certified gold and platinum plaques. And she's an incredible business manager, and I've been working with her now for a little while, and she's a great person. Stephanie Belcher, also a great person. She is a tax preparer. She's based out of Michigan and has worked with clients like Woody Goss of Wolfpack, Madeline Grant, Christine Huckle, and many others. We get into DBAs. We get into how ASCAP pays and what kind of checks you can cash and uh, why you shouldn't be cashing checks uh, that are written to you as an individual into your business account and all the crazy stuff that you didn't really know the answer to that you kind of wanted to know the answer to. Hopefully, we answer them here. And specifically, how do you find these people if you don't know Chloe or Steph or their roster is full and you can't work with them? And and how do these people get paid and how much money get paid? And, and also, of course, I asked them the question, well, what if I can't afford your services? What do I do then? What am I supposed to do as an independent musician where I don't have you know the 5% to pay a business manager or the 150 an hour or whatever it is? And they break down all the fees and all the um, structures of how all this works and how to find these people and what to do if you can't quite afford all of this, um, but it is still really important. As always, please like, follow, subscribe to this show. However you're listening right now, if you just pause it real quick, hit that follow button, subscribe button, like it, that would be amazing. If you leave us a five-star review on Spotify Podcasts and Apple Podcasts, that would be super helpful. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or leave us a comment on YouTube, that would be also very, very helpful. And if you have any questions, feel free to to pop into YouTube and ask those questions in the YouTube comments, and we're going to be in there answering the questions. Um, you can always uh, shoot us an email, info at areastake.com. I don't know if I've ever mentioned that before, but if you have questions, uh, info at areastake.com is the email that you can uh, contact us. Visit areastake.com and get on that email list. That's where we're going to send all the most helpful information, and we let you know every time we have a new podcast out. So, you know, we, we try to release them every week, but uh, sometimes we take some breaks but either way we let you know what those podcasts are we link you to them uh but also everything else that's happening in the industry that you need to know about so ariestake.com get on that email list you can find all of us that make the show happen at Ari's Take on instagram and tiktok and twitter find me at ari herstan on instagram and twitter all right let's kick into the show stephanie belcher chloe Churko, welcome to the show hello <laughs> hi hello we have a this is this is interesting i don't i don't typically do kind of panel discussions i don't i don't really like panel discussions in all honesty um you know at south by or any other conference anything like that um because uh people are so afraid to disagree with one another and and all of that stuff um and when i have bands on it's usually they can they have no problem disagreeing with each other as you know the band chemistry how that works but i'm really excited for this conversation today because it's not it's not that you do the same thing or that you're in the same field it's you get to speak on two sides of this very complicated uh, part of the industry, but very important. Uh, some may argue the most important part of our industry, dealing with the money. Uh, yeah. So so today we have uh, Chloe Churko, who is a business manager, and we're going to get into all that. What's up, Chloe? How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Good, good, good. Um, and we have Stephanie Belcher, who is a tax preparer. Hello, Steph. Yeah. Hello, how are you? And where are you both coming to us from today? Steph, start with you. 
I'm coming from Michigan, Southeast Michigan. I live about halfway between Detroit and Ann Arbor. So I Mm. get the best of both worlds as far as Motown and the University of Michigan School of Music that is giving us such incredible (laughs) artists. And uh, yeah. Like uh, Wolfpack, they're from University of Michigan, right? Who else is from University of Michigan? Let's give some shout outs to uh, UMich or, yeah. Yeah, my Madeline Grant, who is oh, my yeah. favorite jazz vocalist, pop jazz vocalist. She's and out in L.A. now. I just saw her yeah. do the uh, Stevie Wonder tribute at the Troubadour. Um, and I know she does some of those scary pocket sessions. She actually, Madeline, is actually a great DJ. And she DJed after the Brass Roots District shows uh, last summer. She was our late night DJ. She is multi-talented. That's cool that uh, I didn't realize she was from Michigan. Very cool. Oh, yeah. She's amazing. I actually recommended <laughs> her for that. DJ position. I saw. Oh, well, Andrew thank you for that. About it. Yeah, you're yeah. welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's um U of M has a whole plethora. Uh, have you ever heard of Bob Hurst? He's a bass player. Sure. He was in the Today Show band. Yeah, yeah, he has like this whole kind of like Motown jazz family built out of U of M and Wayne State nice. here in Michigan. Yeah, it's a nice little community. <laughs> Love it. Love it. And of course, I mean, I grew up on Motown. My mom is from Detroit. And so uh, it's just Michigan has a as a as a nice place in my heart. Um, Chloe, where are you based today? I am in Las Vegas. Beautiful Vegas. spring weather, Las Vegas. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, yeah, that's where I am. I'm, I Technically, I'm in a suburb of Vegas, but it's okay. just like living in L.A. We live in L.A. We live in Vegas, but yeah. you know, no one talks says they live in Chatsworth. Like, you know, <laughs> gotcha. right. Of course, of course. Home of the 2022 Grammy Awards. How about that? You get that. Yeah. You stole it away from us this year. I didn't even know until about a week ago because I got an email. We have a re- the recording studio here and they're holding an event here. And I was like, mm-hmm. why are the Grammys holding it? We get Latin Grammys every year, but I'm like, yeah. why are the Grammys here? And then I looked it up. I didn't even know. Yeah. <laughs> That's good, though. We like having those music events here. It's really good for, we're trying to make it more of a music based city, like the next, mm. you know, LA Nashville type vibe. So there's a lot of yeah. music moving here. So it makes sense, honestly. Nice. So, um, I, uh, I want to just jump right in and get into the meat of the discussion. Um, You know, I, so let's start with you, Chloe, you're a business manager. Can you just get us on the same page and start lay a good foundation for us? What does a business manager do? What does that mean to be a business manager? Yeah. um, So business manager is very broad. It's like artist manager and what you can do. There's so many different tasks that can be delegated to others, but in a general sense, you know, between Stephanie and I, I'm kind of like the front end person as far as uh, making sure all the month to month stuff is making sense, all the financials, the expenses, the income, doing profit and loss reports. Um, As a music based business manager, I could be doing anything from ensuring all your catalog is being collected properly, like your publishing is coming in from the right places, Mm. uh, your royalties are being paid properly. Uh, you know, checking those kinds of things. I can do things to getting like, as far as like getting um, like insurance, like I get get insurance for people, you know, Mm. whether it's liability insurance, tour insurance, it's kind of anything that to run your business as a musician, I can Mm -hmm. do, Um, you know, the bulk of it is the bookkeeping side of it so that I can pass it off to the accountants at the end of the year and do, you know, the accounting side of it. Some of it's financial, like investment based Mm -hmm. stuff. Um, you know, invoicing, receiving payments, so, you know, any kind of general admin bookkeeping is the bulk of it, but I can do side stuff. I've been doing a lot of catalog audits lately. So just again, making sure everything's registered properly, all the splits are correct across all the places that needs to be. Um, mm-hmm. There's a big, right now, big trend with direct licensing deals with like Sirius XM direct with the bands or direct with the labels. And then it's not going through sound exchange. So now it's collecting that money properly. Cause that's a new place we have to collect money. Um, oh, so wow. Been, I do a lot of chasing. I always say I'm collections. Chloe. That's my nickname is I do a lot of <laughs> chasing of just finding money. Cause it will disappear. You may be getting it at one point and then you're not getting it anymore. And right. you have to find it again. So, so it's a lot of that watching trends, watching patterns on like royalties. If they dip, why did they dip? Is something missing? Was there a direct licensing deal, you know, put yeah. together those kinds of nice. things. Nice. So you actually have to understand how the music business works. It's not just uh, counting the money and collecting the checks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, they always say business managers know a little bit about everything. Yeah. And then maybe they specialize in some things a little more so, but you kind of have to know a little bit of everything to understand how it all works mm. and where everything's coming from and 
what, you know, and then down to like what you can write off. I have to know what kind of things you guys can write off as musicians or music businesses. Right. So actually the sound exchange point is, is an interesting one. I didn't realize. So are they only doing, uh, so did Sirius XM cut out sound exchange and they're only trying to do that must be nearly impossible. How, how does that work? Dean? Yeah, no, it's, so I found this recently and it's about five-year-old deal that I didn't know about. And I noticed it from watching, you know, the sound exchange drop mm-hmm. and, um, for a client of mine and, I went back and went, that's so weird. Where's the Sirius? I don't see Sirius mm-hmm. on these statements. And Sirius XM is doing some deals with some labels. So it's not totally everything, everybody uh-huh. across the board, but they're going to some of the major labels or some of the larger labels and saying, hey, we'll cut a deal with you and we'll just pay you for all your artists that we play. We'll pay you guys directly. You'll get paid more. And then Whoa. you guys, then the labels paying the artist. So it's going, hmm. you know, it's going serious to label, label to artist. But when that happens now, I represent a lot of producers, the producers and engineers or anyone who's getting points isn't getting paid because yeah. technically the band has to pay right. the producers. And if they don't mm. even know a lot of the, it's, I mean, it's a mess. So it's starting to happen. Direct licensing is becoming more popular. It's great because you get paid more. So like, I'm well, kind it. of it's great. Like, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, I would say, I, I don't know about that because I mean, just to hang on this for a second, um, sound exchange pays uh, 50 well, 45% of the money they collect to the featured artist directly. They pay 50% to the rights owner, also known as the label directly. And then uh, 5% is withheld and sent to the fund, the uh, the AFM SAG-AFTRA uh, fund for the, for the backup musicians. Um, so if they now don't send that money to Sound Exchange, just split it up accordingly, uh, and they send it all to the label, I'm assuming the featured artist isn't getting their 45%. I'm assuming they're getting whatever royalty split that the label has designated for them, most likely after recoupment. Is that If they're getting correct? anything at all, because right. again, what I'm seeing is the Sirius will pay, you know, say the label direct, and then they're going, thanks. And they're not realizing they have all these other people to oh pay or all these gosh. other places to pay. So that's what, yeah. uh, that's what I've been doing a lot of is because mm. again, it's happening, but people yeah. aren't realizing it's happening and, and. I think it's going to be more popular. So it's really a matter of like staying on it to find out when that's happening. I just saw recently Pandora's dropped off some of my statements. So I think Pandora is doing the same thing. They're doing direct deals with labels. And mm-hmm. then again, they're just paying labels. Labels are paying all of it to all of the artist portion to the artist and not factoring in featured artists, you know, right. other people who might have points on it. I mean, it's, it's, so I do a lot of that, a lot of chasing and finding. Yeah, <laughs> that's really interesting because because sound exchange was set up by the U.S. government, and that's a it was a it's a legal uh, government entity. I'm curious. I mean, there must be something written into the law where they're able to carve out and do these direct deals because um, I didn't realize that was actually happening with Sirius XM now as well. So uh, very interesting. Okay, cool. A lot of chasing, and that's great because most uh, artists aren't really paying attention to the nuances of all of these inner workings and everything like that. And my gosh, if I just saw that uh, my sound exchange payment was a little bit less this month, I'd be like, oh, I got fewer streams on digital radio. I wouldn't think that there was a direct deal done somewhere and I have to go chase that. So that seems really helpful. Um, <laughs> what about, um, so you, you threw bookkeeping out there and then I'm going to, I want to ask you about bookkeeping and then I, I'm going to hit it over to, to Steph as well. But um, talk to me about bookkeeping specifically. Um, okay. So I understand now a bit of what, you know, business managers do, but I want to know um, we're mostly musicians and artist managers are listening right now. Most of them um, don't have a massive budget to have a massive team where they can pay for all the software or hire people to come on like you. Um, So two questions. One, what do business managers cost if someone wants to like hire your services or anyone's services or just like, what does a business manager cost? How does that business model work? And two, if I can't afford that, what am I supposed to do to keep track of all of my income and expenses? Okay. What do business managers cost? Yes. Generally, it's a 5% gross. That's like the industry standard. That's okay. for a full-on <laughs> business manager that does everything down to, like I said, digging through statements and finding what's missing and chasing it and getting LODs and whatever the case is. Letter that's of for directions. Like full-on every, yeah, sorry, letter of mm-hmm. direction. So that's, that's like full-on business management. 
if mm -hmm. you were to get, and so now with people do being more DIY, they're finding bookkeepers that maybe just only do the bookkeeping. They're not doing all the other stuff. They're just making sure your expenses are good and your profit and losses look good and it's ready for tax time. Mm -hmm. um, that a general bookkeeper would usually cost between like 25 and 40 an hour for like a bookkeeper who knows how to bookkeep to get a music skilled bookkeeper. You're mm -hmm. looking closer to like 50 to 75 an hour that has the knowledge of the music industry. Okay. Um, so you, I have had clients come to me that were with previous bookkeepers that were just general bookkeepers that didn't know about the music industry and they did an okay job. It's not awful. Um, but if you want someone specialized, obviously it's going to be a little bit more. So somewhere in that like 50, 45 to 75 range, I would say, okay. um, if you're doing hourly business management, which is becoming more popular because people don't want to give up 5% of something they've already right. built and then yep. be like handing it over to someone or sometimes business managers won't take on clients that don't make enough money at 5%. Sure. Um, you're looking somewhere between that 75 to 150 an hour, I would say. And obviously mm -hmm. if you're like Taylor Swift, you might be paying 500 an hour. I don't know, but, yep. but I would say for like up to medium level, <laughs> that's what you're going to look at. If you okay. can't afford to do it yourself, or I can't afford to hire someone. Um, yeah. I use QuickBooks exclusively. I love QuickBooks. It's very inexpensive. If you find a QuickBooks licensed person, they can get a deal. Usually it's like 17 bucks a month for the base model forever. Um, it's cheap. It's really user friendly. So you can do it yourself. Someone in the band can do it. Someone on the team can do it. I see lots of managers that do it. I get mm -hmm. lots of my clients, our managers that go, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. Can you do it now? Um, so so managers can do it. QuickBooks is great. Wa I think Wave is great. I haven't used it too much, but I know there's a lot of great apps that can help you and organize Wave everything. And Wave is free to an extent, yeah. I believe, too, right? It's just not as fancy. It, it, it okay. works really well for, I would say, under like, maybe under like 15 to 20% or 20 thousand gross like if you're that's what you're bringing in but once it gets complicated okay. or if you have partners and you want to start making different kinds of reports and getting it ready for accountants differently um mm -hmm. i think quickbooks is a little bit a little bit more advanced for those kinds of things mm -hmm. um but really user friendly it's as easy as like linking your bank account and just like matching transactions and you know better than anyone what you bought so it's easy mm. to go oh that was musical gear or that was a guitar that i bought or nice. that was a membership just to whatever so easy you can set up automations on it now um, you know, cool. your bookkeeping really could take only, you know, once you know kind of what you're doing an hour a month, yep. maybe, I mean, it's, oh, it's not okay. too bad. And it's better than spending 20 hours on March 14th crying because yeah. you <laughs> you're trying to get your taxes. done. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, very helpful. Okay. Stephanie, um, I'm, this is a nice segue because, um, as a tax preparer and as someone who needs to go through all of these books and the income and expenses and figure out what the tax they need to pay, um, what do you need? Uh, also let's say, you know, I'm a musician. I have a lot of business that was done the last year, but my stuff's kind of all over the place. I have a bank account. I have everything that's done through credit cards. I don't, I never used Wave or QuickBooks or, you know, I think I threw some things in an Excel doc once and now it's moved to Google Sheets, but I kind of gave up on that six months ago. So what am I supposed to do? Help me out, Steph. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that's a great question. Um, so the tax return, it's important to understand that the tax return is a reconciliation document of everything that you did in the entire year that is linked back to your social security number. Okay. So if you got paid in any way, or mm -hmm. if you donated money and contributed money to anything, spent any kind of money, opened any credit cards, bought any assets, anything that has to do with a business that's affiliated with your specifically your social security number, it's uh -huh. going to go on your personal tax return. So the information that I need to prepare a personal tax return mm -hmm. is like, it's kind of funny because it's literally everything about you. It is your home address, your legal name. Do you have any dependents? Do you rent or do you own? Do you have a day job where you get a W-2? Do you have any interest in, in a savings account? Do you have any stocks or dividends that are paying you out regularly? You know, a lot of people, this is something that people don't talk about very often in the music business. A lot of people have inheritances and they have stocks that were handed down to them from their grandparents or whoever, and they're getting money 
Mm. that is being taxed in one specific way, but they're using that money for their business, right? So like if you if you have, let's say you have a trust fund or you have like you have your grandparents bought you Disney stock when you were born and you still yeah. have it and you're getting a little dividend every year, that has to go on your tax return. Huh. It doesn't get involved in your business necessarily, uh-huh. but all the money that you're earning mm-hmm. from every different way. And then all these deductions that you kind of um like aggregate throughout the year. Yeah. They, the, all that goes on the tax return and then it all gets reconciled out. So there's Mm. like this meme that goes around every tax season that drives me crazy because it's just like patently false. It says I need to file a tax return. The government already knows how much money I made, but if I get it wrong, then I'm going to jail. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Seen Everybody's that. seen it. Everybody shares it. It's yeah. hilarious, but it's not true at all. <laughs> because That's first good. of all, you're not going to go to jail <laughs> for making a mistake on your tax return. Never. Okay. You're they will send you a thousand letters before they take any legal action against you. Okay. If you are performing criminal activity, like if you're doing criminal tax evasion, then yeah, you might go to jail, but that's like <laughs> that's way further down the line. Okay. If you make a mistake on your tax return, it's usually a very easy thing to fix. But with all that being said, the government only knows what was reported on you. So like when your employer hires you and they pay you, they have to give you a W-2 mm-hmm. and they have to send a copy of that W-2 to the IRS. So then the IRS has your social security number and an income number. And when you go to file your tax return, the computers are going to cross check your social security number, your W-2 number, and your tax return, and make sure that that number got put in the spot that it was supposed to get put on. Right. And if it didn't, then you're going to get a letter from them saying, hey, we noticed that you forgot this W-2 or whatever. Oh, hold hold on one second. So yeah. there's a lot of info there. I'm writing down yeah, furious yeah. notes and I have a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> okay. First off, what is a tax return? Yes, that's a great question. <laughs> um, <laughs> the tax return. Tax Y'all return. are about to find out in a month. So yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. It's like, like yeah. is that the is that the check that I get? Is that my return check? Is that like no. the check that sometimes actually I don't get checks anymore. I have to pay them a lot of money every, every year. But like theoretically, before when I was working at Starbucks, I would get like a check every year. Is that my return? Is that my tax return? What is the tax return? No, that's your no. tax refund. Refund. Okay. Yes. What's the tax return? The tax return is the paperwork. And they call it a tax return because you are essentially returning the documents to the government that reconcile everything you earned, everything you spent. And the big reason for it, and like this is getting a little bit deeper than I think most people care about, but I'm just going to go with it. Okay. Um, In the U.S. government, there's a law that says we don't have to pay income tax on the income that we used to pay other taxes. So when you pay the state of California, Mm, a gigantic amount of state income tax, way too much, that amount gets deducted out of your income tax equation. So you're not paying income tax on the, let's just hypothetically say you paid $10,000 to the state of Mm -hmm. California. You're Mm -hmm. not paying income tax on that 10,000. Okay. That's what the tax return exists for. And you keep using this word reconciliation. What it, yeah. or reconciled? I don't know what that means. Reconcile means to make sure that everything is in the right place and that it's all balanced at the end. So, so it give me an example. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it basically means that um, <laughs> it basically means that you're accounting for everything. Okay. And like, I don't know what the actual definition of reconciliation is. But okay. it means that everything is in the right place. And when the computers come through mm-hmm. looking for errors, they're not going to find any. And what do you mean everything's in the right place? Give me an example of something that would be in the wrong place that should be in the right place. Well, and okay. I was going to say from a bookkeeping standpoint, too, sure. what I yeah. reconcile every month. I do a reconciliation every month, which is me okay. taking all your bank transactions and your bank statement and making sure they match. So making sure your bank statement that's issued by your bank actually Mm. matches what's in your books. 
So that way there's no duplicates. You're not paying tax on more money than you actually have or got it, got that month. Um, so it's, it's for on a bookkeeping level, it's matching the month to month, making sure your bank statement and what the bank saw is the same as what you're showing in your books. And I would mm. imagine that Stephanie can answer further is on the government side. It's like saying, Hey government, this is what you have. And this is what I have. And you're matching what the government has and what, what you as a person have. Oh, well, that's, that's helpful. Exactly. Be- that, yeah. I, when I had QuickBooks uh, and I was looking at it, I remember one time I accidentally I, I, like added one of my cards, credit cards twice on there or something like that. And I, and I was like, oh my gosh, I have so many expenses this month. And I thought that I was, I was about to go bankrupt looking at my QuickBooks because it's like, I had all these crazy expenses that were like quadrupled up there. Cause there was like four, like one card was quadrupled. And the, I, I don't know, I don't really know what happened, but then I looked at my bank account. I was like, wait a minute, that's different. So, so yeah. reconciliation re- to reconcile that, like you're saying is like, you basically cross check, you look at your bank statement and the QuickBooks or wave or Google sheets or whatever you're using. And then you're like, Oh, does this match up? Is that kind of it? Exactly. Yes, that's exactly You're making it. sure that ending balance matched on, on the QuickBooks side or on whatever oh, app you're using. And so cool. I think for taxes, it's the same. You're telling, Hey, the IRS has this number. I have this number. Yeah. We're making sure these are matching and you're correlating with the previous year to make sure nothing's happened. And she can speak more to that. Yeah. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know, just to finish your question about like, sure. what's the tax return. So the tax re- the tax return is this form that yes. says, this is how much we think you earn. The government is saying, this is how much we think you earned. Tell us more. Tell us what we don't know. Mm-hmm. Because the government doesn't actually know everything about you. They kind of have a general idea, especially if you only got one. But Mark Zuckerberg does. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the information exists. Mm-hmm. Like, Don't get me wrong, right. especially <laughs> now with these new 1099Ks. But we can get into that in a little bit. But um So the tax return is the form where you Mm -hmm. list out the tax that you've paid, all the money that you've made, all the expenses that you've paid out through the year, and you put it all onto a form. And then at the end of the tax return, you have an adjusted gross income. And that is your, how much money you made before Mm -hmm. you take out those taxes. And then you Mm -hmm. have a taxable income. And that taxable income is what gets used in our bracket system to determine how much federal income tax you paid. Okay. And the tax return also exists to make sure that you pay the right amount in Social Security and Medicare tax. What is Especially that? Especially if your Social Security tax is a social safety net program used to support senior citizens and people with disabilities. Okay. And Medicare is another social safety net problem. Uh, <laughs> It's not a problem. Sorry. I totally said it's another social safety net used to uh, <laughs> Freddy and slip much. <laughs> no, no kidding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tell yeah, us how yeah. you really feel. Right. All right. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> so Medicare, <laughs> everybody in the country contributes mm-hmm. toward Medicare. It's usually 1.65%. It's a, that's healthcare for elderly. Is that what that is? Yeah. Healthcare okay. for elderly, disability, low income. Got it. Yeah. Or low income. Wait, what's Medicaid? That. I thought that was Medicaid. It I don't know of, the difference. It's all kind of lumped together. Got it. Well, either way, um, how much so okay, let's do some round numbers here because I'm I'm curious about all of this. I so in my uh case, I know that whatever I make about 50%, I live in Los Angeles. Whatever I make, about 50% is going straight away to somebody not me. Um, I just like, that's, those are the round numbers that I have to work with. Um, people are like 50%, no way. They say the tax is only 35%. Well, let's break this down a little bit because I know I have to do 50% because if I don't, if I don't, uh, put 50% somewhere else where I can't see it, then tax time comes around and my accountant comes to me and they're like, you have to pay all of this money that I don't have in my bank account anymore. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, how, how is this possible? I didn't mean, I don't even have this amount of money. So like, I know it's about 50% for me, but like, why is that? Can you break some of these round numbers down? I know that like yeah. most cities don't have the city tax that LA has. Most yeah. states don't have the state tax that California does, but like break this down a little bit. Yeah, sure. If you are self-employed, meaning you're a freelancer or you 
you're giving people a W-9. You're not in a partnership. You're not an owner of an S corp or any kind of a corporation. If you're self-employed, you have to cover your own self-employment tax. Okay. So that's an automatic 15.3% that's going directly to social security and Medicare. Okay. So let's, so 15.3%. Yeah. Uh 15.3%. Nobody in the country is getting out of paying that. Even if you're in the zero tax bracket, you're still paying to. Wait, but you just said that was self-employment. That's self-employment tax, but I'm not self. What if we're not self-employed? Do you still have to pay that? You do still have to pay it, but it's called payroll tax and it's withheld Ah. from your paychecks. So if you look at one of your pay stubs, you're going to see on there that social security and Medicare were withheld from your paycheck. Oh, that's the social security. Okay. So social security, uh, whatever it's called, there's about 15% that is taken out, given to the social security, Medicare. Some people call it payroll. Some people call it self-employment. It doesn't matter what's called. It's 15% gone. Okay. Got it. 15%. So that's the first one. Okay. The second one is your federal income tax, and that's on a bracket system. I don't have them memorized because they change every year. So Uh I just look them up every year. Give me like round numbers, ballpark. Okay. So if you make less than 10,000, you are paying 0% income tax, federal income tax. If you make between 10 and Mm 40,000-ish, you're paying 12%. Okay. And if you make, uh, gosh, I think it's like 41 to a hundred or so you're yeah, paying. Right. Yeah. Then it goes from 12% to 22%. Okay. Chloe's looking it up for me. I'm looking it up. I got it. I'm on Google. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll so, do round numbers, but yeah, that 40 to 80, you know, 40 to 85 is 22%. 86 okay. to 160 is 24%. And then uh, it jumps to 32%. So basically like 165 to 210 is 32%, 210 to 550 is 35%. And then the most is 523, like 523,000, you're paying 37%. And that's it. And that's that's, that's where it stops. 520. Single, yeah, 523, 600 or more. That's all it says. 523 or more is, yep. Um, if you're married at 628, it's a little different if you're married or filing uh, jointly. It is married. Uh, but it's yes. doubled. All those numbers are doubled. There's a benefit to being married. Filing you, get, a joint you get a little return. Got it. Okay. Okay. So that's interesting. Somebody that's making uh, $600,000 is paying the same tax rate as somebody making $600 million. Yep. Correct. Yeah, that's fucked up. All right. So cool. Um, doing 37%, <laughs> so yeah. sweet. So, all right. But anyway, um, but uh, wait a second. I, I'm, I'm still not sure. So th- is this just an individual? So like I have an S corp. So like I personally, Ari, me, I don't make this much. I don't make that money. Um, most ba- most artists in bands that are in like LLCs or S corps or whatever, and we can break down the LLC versus an S corp versus whatever. Part you mentioned partnership. Uh, I want to know what that means too. But like, do these numbers change based on what the individual makes versus what the company or the corporation, I guess the S corp or the LLC makes. So like, let's say the band makes a million dollars, but there's six, uh, you know, six band members. And at the end of the year, they're only pulling in like 40 grand each, you know, and everything else. How does that all break down and work? Yeah, that's a great question. This is what I see the most and what I deal with the most in my tax preparation. So companies have to file a different kind of tax return. It's a completely okay. separate form. So you uh, put in the business's income, the business's expenses. Some businesses get credits, tax credits, and we can come back to that, write that one down too. Um, <laughs> tax credits are yeah. an amazing way to save money in your business, but okay. we'll come back to that. So then the business is going to kick out, I. I the phrase I always use is kick out a number at the end. Income minus expenses equals tax du- taxable income. Okay. And that number then has to be split among the business's owners. Mm. So if you're in a big giant corporation like yeah. Disney, for example, that profit is probably going to be split among all the owners, everybody who owns stock. And it's going to be sent out as a dividend. 
and you're going to get a dividend in the mail and it's going to be like 200 bucks split among millions of people who all own stock in Disney. Okay. If you own an S corp, then that profit is only attributable to the owners. So if Mm -hmm. you are the sole owner and you're an S corp, then you are taking on the full tax liability of that business's entire profit, but it's not subject to self-employment tax because the business is not self-employed. The business is its own thing. Right. So when you became an S corp, Mm -hmm. you started writing yourself paychecks. And when Mm -hmm. you started writing yourself paychecks, you're withholding your social security and your Medicare directly from your paycheck. Mm -hmm. And your payroll company is turning it around and sending it to the IRS on time. And then when your business posts a profit, you do have to pay tax on that on your personal return, but it's considered a capital gain because you are technically an owner of a business. This is too complicated. You lost (laughs) me. I'm like, eyes glaze over. You use so many words. I didn't understand. I got to, I got to, I got to back up. Okay. I got to break it down much simpler. Um, uh, Okay. Okay. Um, question is why would someone become an S corp and what does that mean? Okay. Becoming an S corp means you pay less in tax. Ah, okay. I understand that. Yeah. So I want to pay less in tax. So yeah. I want to become an S corp. So why wouldn't everyone who's listening right now immediately go become an S corp right now? Because there's a lot of rules okay. and it can get very complicated trying to keep the IRS happy with your S corp status. And by rules, I'm assuming you mean a lot of rules, but you more so you mean it's a lot of money. Well, it's only a lot of money in California. <laughs> Are you serious? Cause I pay a shit ton to be, be an S corp every year in California. And like, when I first set up the S corp, they're like, Oh, you know, they were like using this, this quick, like the quick answer I'm looking for is, um, if you make over X amount of money a year, become an S corp. If you don't become an LLC, if you have a partnership, if you don't stay self-employed, do you have any kind of round number? Like um, we want, like, tell us, tell me what to do here. So if like I make over this, yeah. Tell me what to do. What am I supposed to do? Okay. So I have to disclaim this and say that this is not personalized tax advice and I am not legally liable. Nobody sue staff, please. (laughs) This is all all just for entertainment. If you're making (laughs) If you're making, yes, <laughs> if you're making about 50 grand profit, then you're paying self-employment tax on 50 grand. If you're not an S corp. Hold on, if, hold on, hold on. Okay. Uh, whenever you say self-employment tax, that, that always ma- makes me think seven times as hard as I think I need to. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so hold on. I want to repeat back what you just said. If you're making 50 grand profit, meaning after expenses. So I may have made $200,000 in, in uh, total this year, but, but after all the expenses, after the numbers are crunched, I walk away, I got $50,000 in quote unquote profit left in my bank account. Um, now continue. Uh, yeah. So okay. I, I, yeah. You have $50,000 sitting in your checking account Yep. on December 31st. Okay. Okay. Got it. If you are just a freelancer, uh-huh. And you don't have an S corp set up. Okay. Or an LLC, or does that not matter? We're not talking about No, that. an LLC doesn't matter. We'll talk, we'll come back to LLC. Okay. So if we don't have an S corp set up, if you don't have it. an S corp and uh-huh. you're about to put $50,000 on your tax return, mm-hmm. you're going to pay 15% of 50,000 mm. to social security and Medicare. Got that. Or we even start messing around with income tax and state tax. Okay, okay. That makes sense. I got that 15% number. Okay. I remember that one. Cool. Yeah. That's- cool. Continue. So if you're an S corp yep. and you make 50,000 profit, yep. that 50,000 is going to go on your tax return, but it's yep. not subject to self-employment tax. You're not that, paying that 15%. 15%. Got you're it. Not, it's not. It'll be taxed at your personal return rate, whatever right. that is, depending on the tax bracket you right. fall into. Oh, wait, wait, wait. So, so hold on. I wrote them down. I wrote them down. So <laughs> if I made $50,000 in profit, I wrote it down here between 41,000 and 85,000, uh, it would be 22% is the federal tax rate. I pay 22%. 
but I wouldn't, you're saying, wait, I wouldn't pay that 15% if I'm a, if I have an S corp, is that right? So if you're just a freelancer uh -huh. and you put $50,000 profit on your schedule C, you're going to pay 22%. And, I don't know what schedule C means. Sorry. Um, the schedule C is the form in your tax return that you fill okay. out if you're not an S corp, if you're just like a freelancer. Okay. Okay. So on my form. Got yeah, it. Yeah. So it's like Thank an you. extra form that does all your business stuff. Okay. Okay. So if you are not an S corp. Right you're going to pay 22% in federal income tax and 15.3% in self-employment tax. So that, hold on, my math is not great, but 37.3% if I'm not an S corp and I made $50,000 in profit, I pay 37.3% in taxes. Yeah. And it would be a little bit less than that. Cause I'm not, I'm neglecting any deductions that would come out. Oh, it okay. would probably be about 35 or about 33, which probably brings be... us back to right where you're, you're at anyway. Right. Well, so, but, but this also, does this include, are we, did we even talk, we haven't even mentioned state tax or city taxes there though. Right. right? So yeah. that would be on top of that. So if you're in, right. if you're in LA, like me, it would be that 35%, 37.3% plus the LA city taxes, which I don't remember what that is, plus the California state taxes, yeah. which is like an additional 15% or something crazy. Um, that's why I'm getting that like 50% that I pay. Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you're yep. an S corp and you're basically the point of an S corp is like, if you are consistently pulling a profit and yeah. you're not immediately turning it around and spending it, and you're like, keeping it as a savings account, uh -huh. there's, there's a really, it's a really advantageous tax situation for you to skip paying self-employment tax on that. It, it's hugely okay. helpful. That makes sense. So yeah. that makes, that makes sense. I want to save that 15%. I don't want to pay that additional 15% right. if I don't have to. Um, <clears throat> And now, you're from still my contributing, I want to say too, like you're yeah. still contributing to Social Security and Medicare. You're just doing it through your payroll, right? And that's one of the rules of being an S corp. Like I'm dealing with an S corp right now. They didn't run payroll for themselves last year. They didn't you have take to a as an owner. You have to be on payroll if you're an S corp. You have to be on a, in a payroll system for your state. You can't just pay, write yourself a a check for a distribution. Like you have to be on a W two through your business. Okay, as wait. Let's pause. Let's pause yes. there for a second because. Uh, that's a rule, but that's also an expensive rule because that means you need a payroll company. And yes. that means you need to engage a payroll company, which costs a monthly fee, which costs a certain amount per times that they write a check to your quote unquote employees. So if I'm an S corp, let's say it's just me, I'm a singer songwriter. I got one S corp because I want to save that 15%, but my S corp is going to pay me is going to so my S corp, let's call it um, uh, Ari S corp, is going to pay Ari Herstan, the person, uh, a salary every month, just like they're my boss. So just like Starbucks used to pay me uh, a, a paycheck every month. Now Ari S corp is paying Ari Herstan a paycheck every month. Is that what you're saying? Yep. Yeah. And I usually estimate it's about in the costs that cost to do that, like the payroll system, you have to register with the state, you have to pay state payroll taxes. Um, someone mentioned in the comments, you know, you got to get workers comp at that point, get a yeah. workers right. comp insurance policy. I estimate yep. it's usually between like 10 and 16% of your payroll. So if you Ooh. run $10,000 worth of payroll to yourself for the year, um, you're going to pay somewhere between 10 and 16% in like overhead costs to be able to run that payroll. So that's what I'm looking for. So, okay. Yeah. So this is what's important. So all those rules so that we're talking about. it's important when you yeah. switch to an S corp. Yeah. You, wanna, you don't want to switch when you're only making 10 grand because you're paying so much to run that payroll. But if you're making, you're profiting, you know, 60 grand or a hundred grand on your S corp. Now it makes sense because mm. if you're running yourself a $40,000 salary, you're still paying less tax than if you were to take that hundred as a self-employment. Okay, because that 15% that we keep throwing around with the social security, that 15% is on the total profit that you make, but this this 10 to 16% you just threw you just mentioned was of the payroll. So that's just to run payroll. To run payroll. Like so that's how like much a payroll expenses. system costs. That's the expenses, expenses right. of it. Yeah. 
So let's say I'm just going to use round numbers here. So let's say, um, let's say my RE S Corp makes, uh, we had an incredible year. Uh, I got a, some bunch of hits, million bucks. RE S Corp made a million dollars. And, uh, you know, RE individual uh, wants to, uh, got paid a salary from RES Corp of a hundred thousand dollars. So I made a hundred. So me, RE person, got a hundred thousand dollars in paychecks from my RES Corp this year. So I my uh, so um, the million dollar. But but so are you saying I would do ten to sixteen percent of that hundred thousand dollars because that was the payroll? That's the amount yeah. that you're saying. Yeah. And that's just yeah, and that's just payroll expenses. That's your workers' comp, your payroll processor. You, you sometimes there's state payroll taxes you have to pay like mm. quarterly state, which is called 941. Your usually your payroll processor will do that for you and handle that, but it's usually somewhere between like nine, ten and sixteen percent okay. depending on. Okay, and what I do want to throw pay. out. Uh, okay, so let's um, we're gonna. Okay, so let's say we do have people here who are making a significant amount. They're crunching the numbers and they're like, all right, you know, um, it is it is worth it for me to save those fifteen percent in that social security that we're talking about to become an escort. Um, to save that 15%. And I, and like, after we do the payroll, we're going to pay the, uh, the, um, people in the S corp, um, whoever's part of us. So the band members, I guess, or whomever, uh, we were going to run payroll. Um, give me some payroll processing companies that, uh, like, how does somebody even go about this? What is something that makes this easy? Yeah, I, I can speak to that. So, okay. Because somebody in the comments mentioned that you don't necessarily have to have a payroll company, and that is accurate. You okay. can technically just write yourself a check, but the law of paying payroll tax is that when you write yourself a payroll check, you have to turn around and remit the remit, send in mm -hmm. your payroll taxes within a certain amount of time after you wrote that check. Usually it's like a week. Most states, yeah. it's like a week of, of paying someone. You have to pay those payroll taxes within the week. And how yeah. do I know how much in, in payroll taxes I'm supposed to pay? Your payroll exactly. processor calculates that, Exactly. It. But if so I don't have I a payroll to just, processor. Yeah, I wanted to speak to that comment. <laughs> technically, yes. You don't, technically you do not need a payroll company. But, but. there's a gigantic room for error if you do yeah. it that way, because payroll tax because social security and medicare is they're using your money in real time yep so because of that you have to pay accurately to the penny and i have submitted payroll tax forms through cpa offices that were wrong by one penny that got rejected whoa literally and they charge penny. you interest and they'll be like two years behind You'll get yeah. a notice like two years later. It's like, hey, you messed up on this quarter. Yeah. Like it was 10 cents, but we've also charged two years of interest on that. Yes, Whoa. exactly. Yeah. So what all that is to say, yeah, you can skip having a payroll company, but, but you shouldn't really. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're hiring other people. So the the bands that I like to, to transition to S-Corps have other employees besides themselves. And the mm. biggest reason is honestly just to hold them accountable to the payroll system. Because okay. if I convert you to an S Corp and you're a solo singer songwriter, why uh -huh. would you go through all the trouble of doing all yeah. the payroll stuff? If there's nobody on your ass saying, Hey, you need to do it this way, this way, this way. Right. But if your tour manager wants to be an employee and your lighting guy wants to be an employee and your monitor guy and your merch person, band and, yeah, the, and yeah. all those people want to be employees, that's, like there's also employee and contractor laws that I think we should probably talk about where like yeah. if you're telling people when, when to show up, if mm -hmm. you, if they are on your schedule, if you're giving them supplies, if you're not really like letting them pick their projects, you know, they can come to Wednesday's show, but they're going to skip Thursday's show and then they'll be back Friday. You know, that doesn't really work in the music mm. business. If you're on tour, right. you're an employee of the band. Yes. Right. And and yeah, I can actually speak to that directly because when I was working on the AB5 law, um, that was a big point of confusion. It was um, if you're a touring band uh, or a touring singer songwriter and you're hiring a band to be your backup band or hiring anyone to be on tour with you, technically 
uh, they should be designated as employees and begin with W-2 form, not that 1099 form. They're not independent contractors if they're on tour with you. Now, I know most people listening to this and have toured in a band as a contractor, as a quote unquote freelancer on tour. That's technically illegal no matter what state you're in around the country, because like you said, Steph, uh, they're telling you where you have to be. You have to show up to every show. You can't just be like, you know what, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'm going to skip out and oh, I'll, I'll join you on Tuesday if it's within my schedule or whatever. Now, that being said, if you're a hired gun in town, absolutely. So when I hire a drummer to play my show for 200 bucks, they're not on my payroll. I'm going to write them a $200 check or I'm going to Venmo them $200. And that's a 1099 form. Uh, that is because uh, they're my an independent contractor for the night. They don't have, you know, that's the difference, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and you're not yeah. telling them what to do as far as like, you're not saying, you're not telling them, I mean, with the, musicians, it's different, but with like other subcontractor positions, there there's a list on the IRS of the rules that differentiate yeah. an employee from a subcontractor, but like, you're essentially not setting their schedule. You're not telling them how to do their job. You're not providing them with all the supplies they need to do their job. Right. They're, they're managing their, their own stuff for the most part. Mm-hmm. So like, a musician's bringing his own guitar he's or his own drum set or whatever, maybe you're renting, right. one, but you know, he's, He's doing, he's coming to do his thing for you. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, (laughs) So I forgot how we got on that tangent of employee (laughs) or whatever. Well, you mentioned payroll processors, which I wanted to give like just two little shout outs. Thank you. Because you don't have to go through a massive payroll processor. Like everyone thinks of like ADP, ADP, ADP as like, that's I. Nuts. That's so fancy and so not necessary. Um, I like uh, QuickBooks Payroll has a great payroll system. You can okay. also pay contractors through QuickBooks Payroll, which is really nice and easy too. Um, yeah. And then uh, I've recently been using Gusto, which I love, yeah. and I'm moving people to Gusto now because cool. I really I enjoyed it. Yeah, is it Gusto or Gusto? Gusto. 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 Gusto yeah. yeah. Um, Gusto is great. And then there are if you Google like best like you know even small business payroll systems. There's a ton of them where they're low overhead. They're maybe twenty to forty dollars a month for this for the service. And and a lot of the times you can set it up where they will send in your payroll taxes automatically after you run payroll and stuff. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to manually like write a check to the state for your payroll taxes. There's, there's a lot of good, like lower, lower tiered ones and like an ADP that's going to charge you $300 yeah. a month to run your payroll. And, and yeah, what, what is a lower tier lower? What are we talking? What does Gusto charge a month or how, how what does that work? Uh, a lot of times they charge Ish. like a base rate and then per employee. So usually it's somewhere around like 25 to $35 a month. Plus maybe it's like four to $8 per employee. Okay. So, it just depends so that's on what you have. Yeah. And that makes sense. And that's why um, you know, uh, not to get into the weeds of the AB5 conversation that I worked on a couple of years ago in California, where they were like, no, every single person you hire, even if they play one gig uh, for $200 at the hotel cafe has to be on payroll. I was just like, that's going to kill every musician because it's like, if I have to pay $25 plus $10 a month for every single person, I, I might hire 50 people to play on my record and play the shows and do all the gigs around town and all of that this year. That's That becomes wildly expensive. Um, so that's not feasible. But like you're saying, if you're going on tour and you got 10 people on your entourage on tour, they do have to be on payroll. So that's the 10 people that you're going to throw into Gusto um, and you'll pay the 25 bucks a month or whatever it is, plus each person. And then um, they'll be paid. Now, I do want to because this is really important. A lot of people have questions about LLCs. Uh, yeah. versus S corps because LLC is something that just gets thrown around that every band's like, Oh, we should form an LLC. That's mm-hmm. just like, nobody knows what that means, but they're like, Oh, we should form an LLC. Uh, and, and I'm sure a lot of people listening to this is like, I've never even heard of an S corp before today. And we spent the majority of the time talking about S corps. We didn't even touched LLCs, but LLCs are more popular. What do LLCs mean? And why would someone do an LLC? And when do you do an LLC? Versus an S corp versus uh, being just me, myself, and I. Who wants Good to question. take the staff? Go for it. Yeah, I'll start, and then I want I want to turn it over to Chloe to talk about how to set them up because she's more okay, cool. involved with that currently than I am. Cool, cool, so, cool. So, an S corp. I'm I'm sorry. An LLC is a yeah. legal term. LLC is a legal term. Okay. LLC is not a tax term. Mm. You can be an LLC and file one of three different kinds of tax returns. Okay. So when you're forming an LLC, what you're doing is you are protecting your personal finances from liability. 
Ah, li- LLC stands for Limited Liability Corporation. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah. Limited yes. liability. Got yes. it. It basically <laughs> means if I if the owner or an employee of the company makes a mistake, uh-huh. the owner's personal assets are not necessarily going to be brought They're up protected. in court. Right. They're protected. Mm-hmm. So like mm-hmm. for me, for example, I have Steph Belcher Business Management LLC. And I have a separate bank account for it. And everything I do is run through that LLC. And so Mm -hmm. if I get sued, the only funds that are available for paying out the damages of the person who sues me is what my business owns. I want to bring up what David just said in the the comments. He's like, we did an LLC because of a limited uh, liability if someone in the band gets sued. Meaning if my bass player hits someone in the head walking to the stage, then I can't lose my house. Exactly. I always say that. I always say if someone trips and falls, on stage or on in your office or whatever, and they want to sue you, they, it's easier to, I always say, this is my, this is like not professional advice, but I always say it's easier to bankrupt your LLC than it is to bankrupt your life. (laughs) So if you get sued and it's so much that it's caused damages, you can just bankrupt your business and say, take it all. Here's the 10 grand in my bank account, in my business bank account, but then your house is protected. Your car is protected. Your retirement money is protected. Like your actual like personal assets are protected. So I always keep And I don't, again, not personal, professional advice. I keep very low amounts of everything in my business. I, I, cause in case I ever got sued, I have good insurance, but you never know. Um, so again, it's, it's easier to bankrupt your LLC than it is to bankrupt your life. If you had, if someone Uh, were to sue you. So uh, that makes sense. Set up an LLC. And I think that's most people, that was my understanding, you know, 15 years ago when they're like, oh, you don't want to get sued, set up an LLC. I was like, oh, okay. I don't know what that means, but sure. Um, so I don't want to get sued, but, but Steph, you just said that has no tax implications. So what's the difference between an LLC and an S corp? Do I set up both? Am I supposed to be both an yeah. S corp and an LLC? Yeah. You should set up an LLC as soon as you start receiving money or as soon as you have any assets that need to be protected. Okay. Whether you're an S corp or not, you, if you're making money in any industry, anywhere, you should legally protect independent your money assets. though, not W2. Like if you were getting like right. any, if you're, someone's going to send you a 1099, you should be an LLC in my, in, okay. So Chloe, let's, thing, let's right? talk about this a little bit more and setting these things up. So I'm still a little confused. Um, if do you set up an LLC first and then you set up an S corp later, do you set up both at the same time or can I set up an S corp and not have an LLC? So I usually tell people this is once you start taking in money, even if it's like four grand, five grand a year, whatever, be an LLC. If you have something protect, whether it's your house, whatever the case is, make set up an LLC. It's generally pretty easy depending on the state that you're in. You can do it online yourself. You can hire someone to do it for you. Mm -hmm. Um, set up your LLC. Once you're ready, as we talked about earlier of like how much money you're actually making and what your profits are looking like, then you can convert to an S corp. Um, I always say do an LLC, even if it's just you, cause lots of people won't do it. They'll run their business as yeah. like Chloe Cherko. And I'd write, and if I send someone a W nine, my social security number is on it. Always right. set up the LLC so that you have uh-huh. a tax ID number, get a tax ID number, and then submit that W nine, even if and it's how Chloe much- Cherko you're paying. So how much is it to set up an LLC and how, and what are the rules? We were talking all about these rules with S corps. Are there rules for LLCs? Yeah, there, yeah, there are rules. It's not as strict as like an S corp would be. And Stephanie might be able to speak to that more as far as cost goes again, depending yeah. on the state, it's uh, somewhere to, for the initial setup, it's somewhere between like 200 and $600 for an LLC, depending on or the state. A, no, California is 800, but yeah. <laughs> they they yeah, kill well, you in uh, California. Yeah, twenty five dollars. But what you guys, oh have, my which gosh, is, cool, is it's not as expensive to renew. So like mm-hmm. in Nevada, when I set it up, it's three about three fifty, and it's that every year. I pay three fifty every year. Whereas oh, wow. for California, you guys only pay like twenty bucks to renew it each year, or like twenty five bucks to renew it, which is crazy. In the LLC. So okay. so yeah, so it it just depends on the state. And then mm. as far as filing, I tell a lot of people, you can do it yourself. A lot of people don't realize they can do it themselves. They'll go pay a lawyer $300 to file it. Now get a lawyer for your partnership agreements if you have a partnership or something, but you can do it yourself. Um, some people, you know, bookkeepers and like tax people sometimes will charge like 75 bucks to do the filing. It, mm-hmm. It's pretty reasonable. Michael just said, Michael said in California, the LLC annual filing fee is $800. That's what I thought too. Yeah, that's what I thought. Every year though? I thought it was out every yeah, year. Yeah, that's what I thought. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's um, insane. 
Yeah. Um, I only have S corps in California as clients. So I'm not sure. I, I, <laughs> I just know the S corps are hefty. Yeah. It's California is not, uh, they, they, yeah, we're, we're highly taxed here and then they, yeah. they find every way to get fees from us. Um, so, okay. In New Mexico, it's $50, but yeah, California, it's expensive. So, all right, you have to, so you got to form that LLC if you can afford the $800 every year, but the S corp is, uh, I think more expensive, right. Every year, like $2,500 or something. Or? Yeah. Usually it's more. Yeah. And then, um, but with an LLC, you don't have to run that payroll like we were talking about with S Corp. Is that correct? Right. Because those, they're totally separate. LLC is legal and S Corp is tax. And uh. so there, the rules for LLCs don't usually have to do with like money changing hands as much as they have to do with like legal protections and legal separation. So like mm -hmm. the biggest rules for having an LLC is that you're maintaining, it's called the corporate veil. And that means that the business is operating as its own thing mm. and it's behind what they call a corporate veil. And so like, if you got sued, there's a chance that the judge is going to take you into court and start, um, you know, like questioning you about how you ran your business. Did you operate behind the corporate veil? Did you take all checks and all payments to the business's name? Mm -hmm. Did you make all phone calls from the business's phone line? You know, things like that, where it's like, you have to really keep the business and the personal separate. So with that being said, some LLCs don't hold up in court because the owner of the LLC didn't maintain that corporate veil. Oh. That's why you need a bookkeeper. That's the first thing I ask any client I ever talk to or anyone who asks me questions about working with a bookkeeper business manager. First thing I say is, is your LLC set up or UNES Corp? And is everything separated? Are you mm -hmm. running personal out of your, like, that's the first thing I do is let's separate that. If you're running your personal transactions out of your business yeah. account and vice versa. And that makes sense because a previous uh, bookkeeper accountant that I had years ago, um, What's because I, I I used to be an actor in a former life and uh, I still get SAG checks and they're written to my personal name. They're written to um, me as an individual, not my S Corp that I set up and all the business that I do right now is through my S Corp. And I'm just like, can I just take these checks from SAG and just like deposit them into my business account? Like, what's the difference? I want to save that 15%. And he's like, no. And that's the reason, I guess, because yeah. like if I ever got audited or whatever, they'd be like, wait a minute. This check was written to Ari Seth Herstand, but you deposited it into the Ari's Take Inc. account mm -hmm. and you didn't keep up that corporate veil. So what happens? I go to jail. No, I'm just kidding. What? <laughs> and they might 1099 you. Like that company that like they make 1099 you personally. And if you've been depositing it into your business account and oh, under right. your federal ID number, now you're not claiming it on your personal tax return because you're showing it on your business books. Now you so, can change a lot of that though, too. Like I have yeah. changed a lot of like publishing that was for a single person personally, I'll change it to their LLC later. Um, well, so okay, so let's, change it too. let's talk about the names and the changing and all yeah. that. And Becca just asked a question about DBAs um, doing business as, let's talk about what's in a name. What's the importance of a name and how do you change from uh, just my social security number as the individual that they're paying me to, uh, what is, well, first off, what's a DBA and what is that, when is that used? Who wants to take Chloe, this? Whoever wants to take it. that? Chloe, go a, DBA, for it. a DBA is doing business as in some states it's called a fictitious firm name. It's ultimately like a protector and it's another way you can deposit checks. So someone can do, um, uh, someone can write me Chloe Churko a check, but if I have a DBA set up to pink noise management, they can also write a check to pink noise management and I can still deposit it. And then it kind of has a bit of that veil of it's not coming to me. It's going to pink noise management. Uh -huh. um, I have lots of businesses like who will have like, Chloe Cherko LLC, and they'll have like 15 DBAs because they're doing so many different things under one business, so many different yeah. kinds of things. And they don't want to like cloud, you know, the, well, they are clouding it, but you know, they go, they can pay those checks out to different, in different ways and deposit it into the same account. Um, oh yeah. When I was talking it, you, you know, it's not required to have a DBA, but you, a lot of people have them. And I guess if you, uh, if you don't have a publishing company and you're working with your performing rights organization, like ASCAP or BMI, uh, specifically, uh, you know, and you set up a, a, what's called a vanity publishing company, like ASCAP always says, you know, they're going to write 50% of 
the money to the publisher and 50% to the songwriter. But if I'm both and I don't have a publisher and I don't want to pay all the money to set up a whole company, corporation, LLC, blah, 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 blah. I can just set up a DBA and tell ASCAP, be like, hey, my publishing company is, um, you know, XYZ publishing. Uh, it's not a real corporation. It's not, uh, you know, if I wanted to go set up XYZ uh, publishing with my bank, the bank would tell me, where's your EIN? Where's your tax mm -hmm. ID number? And I'm like, well, I, I don't. And then now ASCAP's writing me checks and they'll be like, hey, XYZ publishing. I'm like, what am I to do with these checks? I can't deposit them anywhere because I don't have a bank account. But you're saying I could set up a DBA. Who do I yeah. set this DBA up with? So it's the with the state, depending on the state you're in. It's always with the state. It's literally usually like a one page form. You get it notarized. It says Chloe Cherko, uh, DBA, Pink Noise Management. Okay. And then you can submit that to your bank. So you get it notarized. You send it to the state. Uh, the state will like certify it. You pay a filing fee. It's like 25 to 50 bucks, depending. Again, I don't know all the state's fees, but. Um, and then you can bring that to your bank. So I can go, Hey bank, I know my account is to Chloe Cherko under my social, but here's my DBA. People can now pay me to this name as well. And I have this check to deposit and then the bank will enter that into the system. So your bank account will show as Chloe Cherko DBA, uh, whatever. So you and just I don't have need that form. It's just a state form that they'll certify and then you can give it to the bank. And that's not like an annual fee or a big expensive filing no, fee, one, like an LLC. One time. One yeah, time. One time. And just to confirm, I don't need an LLC. I don't need an S Corp. I don't need anything to have a DBA. I can just be me, individual person. They call it a sole proprietor, but just me, person, yeah. uh, individual. I can do it, get a DBA. And now I can have people write checks to every kind of thing that I want. And the only benefit to do an LLC is for that liability, limited liability is to protect me from my bass player whacking somebody and them suing me and losing my house, right? Yeah, but that's Got an it. important, it's not the only thing. It's like literally so important to protect, like it's so important to be an LLC if you can, if you yeah. can afford it and put it together. And like I said, California is really high. That's a lot of money, but um, you know. Is it something that I can important. do or, or like, because there's a lot of questions about, um, you know, I'm writing the third edition of my book right now. And I just had the legal read with the attorney that vets every word, every sentence, every line in my book. And we got into it and she was like, don't, She's like, I am removing legal zoom. I, I will not allow you to <laughs> recommend legal zoom. I will not allow you to put legal zoom in here. Legal zoom in my mind does not exist. Never use legal zoom. It is a nightmare. I'm just like, Oh my gosh. All I right. I'm just that. like, you support that. I support that yeah. too. Okay. Yeah, and so I, I, I fix a lot of legal zoom reason. issues. I'm yeah. Sure you have what? too. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> so legal zoom in their, uh, desire to upsell convinces people to let legal zoom be the registered agent. And that means that LegalZoom is like the boss of your business as far as okay. everything is concerned. And that's enough reason for me right there not to ever recommend them because mm. it's too easy to accidentally click, yes, let LegalZoom be my registered agent. Yeah. But I like Chloe and I have talked about this offline, like fixing LegalZoom problems. It's... I, it's like, I'm hesitant to like talk shit about legal zoom because I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> um, there's just a lot about of that. It. Again, it's like a gigantic room for error in there. Okay. Well, yeah. uh, okay. So you fine. can use it, but it's like, try it's to find something else careful. first. Okay. Like, but, really so let's talk. Careful. So I'm all, I'm, a, I'm someone who wants solutions and I don't want to tell somebody uh, don't use legal zoom. Good luck doing, you know, it on your own. And like, I see people throwing like links to like IRS websites and on all this craziness. Like I, what is someone supposed to do? Like, I don't, let's say w before this call, I didn't know a single business manager. I didn't know a single tax repair. I don't know anyone other than the internet and the internet tells me to use legal zoom so like what am i supposed to do how do i i don't know how to file a, an llc or a dba or an s corp or or whatever like where do i find these people that can help me do this and i also don't have you know uh 250 350 an hour to pay an attorney let alone find an attorney to do this for me so like i get the I appeal the of legal solution. zoom chloe hit me <laughs> What is it? 
this is what I do. Cause people ask me all the time. I have clients in all, all States, all kinds of States. And they'll say, Hey, I need to set up an LLC. Like do your job, find me an LLC, you know, set it up. Always Google whatever state you're in California set up LLC or California set up business. First hit legal and- zoom. Yeah. <laughs> right. Scroll down a little <laughs> Go and find, find the link that goes to the state site. They're all called different things. You know, the, the state, whatever your state site is for setting up businesses. And there's usually all, uh, every state I've looked up so far will have file your business checklist on the state site. And it'll tell you mm. exactly what documents you need and what you need to do. And you can do it yourself. And a lot of states, if not all right. of them now, you can do it online. So you can set up a username and password through the state online and you can set it up yourself. There Got are it. some states that require registered agents, but a lot of the time you can register yourself as an agent as long mm-hmm. as you have a local address. So if I'm like setting, I set one up in Louisiana not that long ago. So because I'm not based in Louisiana, I can't be the registered agent because my address is in Nevada. Yeah. But what I did is I said, hey, client, can I use your address and make you the registered agent on this? Because you huh. live in Louisiana. And I used his address and used him as the registered agent. And so, uh-huh. and I still set it up for him. I mean, I don't know if that's illegal because I'm ghost setting no, up LLCs, fine. but, but uh, you, <laughs> no, you can fine. set yourself up as the, as the, legal, <laughs> like as the registered agent, because most business LLCs need a registered agent, but just Google, you know, California set up business license and, or business, you know, LLC, and there'll be a checklist LLC. right on the state site usually. And it'll come up and again, you can usually register online and do it. And, you, you, but a lot of people don't realize they can be the registered agent. So you don't have to go find, that's what legal zoom kind of like hooks you in with is we'll be uh-huh. your registered agent because we can set this up, but you don't necessarily have to like have a third party. You can register yourself and be your own registered agent. So what's this talk about everyone registering a business in Delaware because you save taxes or oh whatever? How do I do that? I don't want to pay all I these just taxes. I called my lawyer about this. <laughs> Literally like a week ago. I, uh, okay. So I talked to a lawyer literally. I don't know if you guys know Eric German. I was talking to him about it. He's out of LA. He's a big fancy pants lawyer. I said the same thing. Why is everyone in Delaware? Cause I keep getting these clients in Delaware that don't live in Delaware. Yeah. He, his words verbatim. And I have this in an email cause he sent me a follow-up is, um, that was an old school practice because Delaware had different state taxing laws and Uh it is not very common anymore, but a lot of lawyers, especially lawyers who've been around a while, just continue to do that. Lawyers and accountants will continue to set them up in Delaware, but it's not always necessary now. Uh Um, And he says he's seeing it less, but it's still happening because it's just ingrained in people's heads that Delaware has a lower state tax or like, or has no, I think it might even have no state tax or a lower. It's a tax thing. It's right. lower. Maybe Stephanie knows a little more, but it's actually not necessarily required now to set that up in Delaware. Um, but if but do you need a physical like a, address. Yeah. So a lot of people will use lawyers addresses in Delaware uh, and they'll use um, legal zoom. I have a lot of legal zoom, Delaware corporations. Um, it, it's, he said, it's just not a, really a thing anymore, but it's like, just ingrained in people's heads. Cause it was, it, there was a huge benefit to registering in Delaware for tax purposes to register right. your business in Delaware, but it, now it's, it's not as much. So, um, okay. I see Delaware everywhere. It's, it drives me nuts because dealing with Delaware is also difficult. So I've had to like call them and I'm like, I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> well, I, cause I was like wondering when I'm setting up my escort, I was like, all right, I live in probably the most expensive city in the entire country for taxes. Like, I don't know if there's a higher tax rate than what I'm paying right now, being in the city of Los Angeles, in the state of California, in America. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if like my city council members coming knocking on my door and saying, oh, by the way, you owe district five uh, taxes. <laughs> I'm just like, it's just like, oh, and then like, you know, this it's just like, it's it's crazy. So I'm just like, well, why didn't I set it up somewhere else? Uh, not, not, not where I actually live. Back uh, in the day, that's why they did it. Cause there was a tax benefit to not okay. setting, a lot of Californians would set it up in Delaware because there was a tax difference. I don't, I, I, can't I have do that. the quote, I have the quote from him, but he said that, that difference from back in the day is gone now. Like you still have uh, to pay tax in California now. So uh, he said, it doesn't really matter, but people are still yeah. doing it, but there Thank was you. a benefit back in the day. Good By the way, know. Nevada is no state tax. So if you want to move Ari's take to Nevada, you've got no <laughs> state tax and we have lower taxes. Like, lower But can I tax. legally, but like you said, like, can I legally do that? Or, or is this something where it's less like, I mean, where's the law come down on this? You'd have to be operating out of Nevada, technically operating out of Nevada, you know, 
how gray you could get with that. We could talk about off a recorded line, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, if you register in a state or in your, you run, you're running your business in a state that you don't live in, or you're not operating out of like it was yeah. of Ari's take headquarters. Like if, if you have an office address in California, but you're sh- saying you're, I'm doing this out of Nevada, you're going to be in trouble, but right. you know, you could, and people do it, but you have to be very careful because it is illegal technically if you're living in California and running your business in California, but you're saying you're in Nevada. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Chloe, uh, for all of the wisdom drops. Um, and, uh, this is super helpful and where can people find both of you if they want to get in touch and they want a business manager, they want a tax preparer. Yeah. So Chloe is at Pink Noise Management, and that's pinknoisemgmt.com. And she's cool. amazing. I, re- I So I prepare taxes, and I refer everybody to Chloe for business management. Um, Including and, me. That's how I found yeah. Chloe. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you, by the way. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> and so I, I'm focusing on, I just renewed my preparer's certificate today, actually. Okay. So I can help people file taxes. Now, as of today, I can sign and prepare returns, which is really exciting. I took two years off to stay home. I have three kids and I've been home with them for a while now, but I'm starting to get the itch to get back out there. So nice. my website is stephbelcher.com. That's cool. S-T-E-P-H-B-E-L-C-H-E-R.com, I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I have a podcast called When Songs Mean Business, where I talk about this stuff a little bit more in depth. And nice. I would be happy to talk, chat with any of you. I, yeah, I. Um, Amazing. Well, I before we before we sign off, I have um, one final question that I ask everyone who comes on the show. Um, and the question is, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? Chloe, let's start with you. Oh my gosh. That's like, I didn't know you asked that. I wish I would have known that. I would have thought about it harder. Oh, um, this is a prep question that we're supposed to send out. Well, I don't think you got our pre pre podcast. I, I don't think I got it. That's like, I, okay. Like, uh, no, um, I would say to me, what it means to make it is when you are, if you're not a hobbyist, um, you're profitable, you're making some money and you feel in control of your business and your musicianship. And you feel like, you know, what's going on. You're understanding what's going on in your music business. If mm. that makes sense. That's how I yeah. see that is once you, once you understand and you're not going, I don't know, I don't know how it works. I just get a check from ASCAP, but I don't know what it means. Like once you really know and understand that, I think you've made it because that's a lot Love to it. already understand. <laughs> Hell yeah. Stephanie. Yeah. I think my answer, my answer is a little more existential. I <laughs> think that if you as a musician or as somebody in the industry, if you've helped one person get through a shitty day, then you've made it that day. Oh. And I don't know necessarily if what the rest of your life is going to look like, but if you really get right down to it, today is the only day you really have anyway. So be in this moment and help one person today with your music and with your story and with the light that's in your soul and like make somebody dance, make somebody sing, make somebody call their mom and then you made it that day. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna cry. Chills. Now All right, I look amazing. like a jerk. You made me look no. like a jerk. I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> no, 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 no,